What's up, heathens? How's everybody doing today? Hope you're doing all right. I'm doing pretty good. Well, if you guys don't know, I am a mythicist. I tend to lean towards minimal mythicism. <laughs> and there are plenty of YouTubers out there that don't share in uh, this position. One of them happens to be Christy Winters, who recently uploaded like three videos against this idea of mythicism in support of the historical Jesus theory. But today I do want to go over Christy's video, uh, her open letter to mythicists, and then I will be tagging tackling her other two videos. So, Christy! I'm going to lay out my cards on the table now and state that I think that this view has more in common with climate change deniers than with professional historians teaching at universities around the world. Coming for you. Four. I'm not here to convince you that the historical Jesus can be established by looking at Josephus. That is not my purpose. My whole approach here is that we have this evidence. It exists. And when we read the evidence, and when we read what the texts have to say, and we study them, and we analyze them, what we find is that we observe theological changes over time. For instance, mythicists really don't engage with the fact that there were massive, huge disputes over the nature of Jesus's body in the first two centuries of the early Christian movement. Actually, this is not true at all. On minimal mythicism, we would actually expect these kind of theological debates to happen because this messiah figure wasn't based on an actual person in history. I mean, uh, whether it's a dispute over his body being divine or other parts of the theology. During the theological evolution of Christianity, pagan ideals were introduced into the religion because pagans started to convert to Christianity. Now, her whole gripe here is about how adoptionist theology got worked into uh, Christianity and how minimal mythicism or mythicism in general would handle this and explain the evidence. Now, in the first century, there was a group of Jews known as the Ebonites that had this whole idea of a Davidic Jesus or Jesus being directly connected to the line of David. This is, of course, according to Justin Martyr, who was writing in the second century, about 150 to 165. Now, there was a second group of Jewish Christians that came up with a different lineage. And we know that these two groups that were at odds in the lineage of Jesus, because Matthew and Luke have these two different <laughs> lineages uh, expressed in it. One from the Ebionites and uh, another one from another group. These Jewish Christians needed a Davidic link because that was important to their Jewish theology. And, you know, Jews always took an adoptionist kind of look to the Messiah. Each new king in Judah... Uh, was labeled the son of God or was adopted into the family of God. Since the first Christians were Jewish Christians, you know, being that they were coming out of the Jewish faith and adopting this new Messiah-based faith, we would expect to see this being the first indication of, of, you know, the paternity of Jesus. We would expect to see adoptionist theology as, as far as it starting out to be that. So we have to ask what effect this would have on the theology of Christianity. And how exactly did adoptionist theology kind of fade out and, and become a more divine Jesus. Well, what we would expect to see is a changing theology of Christianity as it merged with other cultures in the region, mainly pagans. The adoptionist theology still has its remnants in the Gospels now. Mark, being the earliest gospel, uh, has a reference to this adoptionist concept, being that his gospel doesn't start until Jesus is baptized and the Holy Spirit or the Messiah inhabits the body of Jesus. And then the Gospel of John, and the reason why I'm specifying Gospel of John and the Gospel of Mark is because Matthew and Luke are derived off of Mark and other sources. But in the Gospel of John, he has Jesus or the Messiah being a pre-existent figure to creation, like he was there with God at creation. How Jesus became a divine figure lies in the paganism that changed Christianity. 
And we know that paganism definitely did change Christianity because you had pagans that were coming out of their respective faiths and into Christianity. And with them, they brought this notion of immortal gods having sex with mortal women and impregnating them and having demigods. And this could be said about almost all the cultures in the Mediterranean at about this time. And we know this because Plutarch actually says that it is a fact conceded by all. Now we know that this adoptionist theology extends well into the second century because you have Justin Martyr in 155 to 165 talking about some of his other brothers in Christ not accepting that Jesus is a divine figure. We can already tell by 155 that paganism was directly affecting Christianity and its uh, theology. This is exactly what we would expect to see if Jesus only existed as a literary figure, if the Messiah only existed as a literary figure and it was interpreted by people. You would see a changing theology. People had very firm views as to whether or not Jesus was completely human or partially human or fully divine. The nature of his body, the material substance that his body was made of, is a huge issue. For me, we need to be able to account for that. Let's just take the premise that the historical Jesus didn't exist and he was completely made up. Mythicists still have to be able to account for the fact that we observe these theological fights. <laughs> yes, we do. I agree. But minimal mythicism does indeed account for this theological fistfight. The theology of Christianity changing over time as new cultures are, uh, you know, merged into it, as more cultures adopt it, they are going to change how they view Christianity based on their own cultures. And that is a fact that has been demonstrated over and over again across time. I mean, just think about how our culture has changed Christianity now. I mean, Throughout the history of the United States, you see a, a changing theology of Christianity. At one time, it was very Christian to have slaves, and people justified slavery with Christian. They also justified the subjugation of women with Christianity. But as society changed, so did Christianity. Just like in the first century, as society changed, as new uh, viewpoints, as new biases were injected into Christianity and the Christian community, Christianity began to change, and that is what we see. And it is totally logical and completely makes sense that it would go from an adoptionist theology to a more divine theology. Because the first Christians were Jewish Christians coming from an adoptionist viewpoint. So they would have taken up an adoptionist view of the Messiah. There are no assumptions in that. I am using facts in order to rationalize the evidence that we see. The demigod Jesus is a pagan invention. We are debating how do we best explain the evidence we observe. So we have all of these ancient writings. Those are our observations. And when we read and we study these texts, we can come up with questions based on observation. For instance, like I did in the first video, why do we see Aramaic remnants in Greek language texts? Now, the first Gospels were not eyewitness testimonies at all. And I think that both of us, Christy, can agree with that. But it does not break minimal mythicism or mythicism in general to have Aramaic in the Gospels. I mean, prior to it being written down, we had oral tradition. And to suggest that, you know, Aramaic in the Gospels shows that Jesus actually existed, that's a bit of a leap, and you're not actually solidifying Jesus in history with that statement. Because all Aramaic being in the Gospels proves is that Aramaic was being spoken around the time that they were written. That is all that it proves. There is no concrete link to Jesus in that reasoning. To say that this Aramaic in the gospel text proves that Jesus actually existed would be to say that Jesus was the only person that spoke Aramaic around that time and that Jesus was the only motherfucker out there speaking a whole bunch of gibberish to other people. This does not break mythicism because other people were speaking Aramaic at the time and it very well could have been worked into the actual gospel Gospels when they were written down. Another question that I'll be exploring in the next video is, why is it that we see adoptionist theologies, the idea that Jesus was a human being who was adopted by God to be his Messiah or son of God early in the Jesus movement, but by the end of the first century and the start of the second century, 
Jesus has been transformed into a divine being. How can we account for this change over time? Adoptionism again. I don't know why you're harping on this. Go back to the first five minutes of this video. These are all things that, when we look at the fact that the historical Jesus was a Jew who was a monotheist living in the Galilee, and we go through and look at how the religion itself became internationalized and it brought in a lot more pagans, we can use historical facts in conjunction with the theory to account for the shifting theology. In contrast, the problem with having multiple mythical Jesus theories is that each author will provide a different answer to the same questions based on whether or not they think that the Jesus movement was Paul experiencing a celestial being through Revelation, or Jews who were influenced by Stoicism and Philo, or a minimally historical Jesus fused with the Christ of Christianity. Each of these authors is going to look at it in a different way. And you know what? That's fine. That's the whole point of a theory. But the question is, what do they then tell us about the observable evidence? You know, at this point, Krista, you're falling to the exact same issue that, that the previous commenter just talked about. You're claiming this one historical Jesus theory or set of data and comparing it to the multitude of hypotheses that have been presented in favor of a mythical Jesus. I will agree that a lot of them do seem pretty out there. A lot of them don't make sense. A lot of them are not based on actual evidence. But if you take the, the serious uh, claim to a mythical Jesus, instead of doing this straw man kind of performance here, uh, presenting these really shitty theories or hypotheses and debunking them and, and, and claiming some kind of uh, victory over mythicism, it's just sad. So instead of comparing your one to the multitude of mythicist uh, hypotheses, how about you pick the mythicist hypotheses that you feel is best uh, uh, representative of the evidence? I would say that that's myth, uh, minimal mythicism. It would be the same kind of mythicism that is proposed by Dr. Carrier, and it's based on evidence. Dr. Carrier goes through the evidence and explains everything. But he's not the only proponent of this minimal mythicist uh, theory. There are plenty of them out there. Price. I would say that Price is, is a proponent of minimal mythicist here, uh, uh, theory. Uh, you do mention DM Murdoch in your uh, in 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 your uh, videos here, and I would say that that she, with all due respect, is not the best representative of the mythicist position. She did have some crazy kooky ideas, but uh, at the same time, I think that you need to compare your hypothesis to the uh, minimal mythicist theory, the, the minimal mythicist theory that is based on the exact same evidence that you have. That way, it doesn't seem like you're trying to straw man the mythicist position, because that's all you seem to be doing at this point is straw manning the mythicist position without actually debunking any of the claims of mythicism. You're asking me to explain things, and I can't explain them, but I just don't see like where you're going, like what evidence you have to disagree with mine other than, nah, -uh, Jesus is ex ex existed. He, he definitely existed because, uh, he, he existed because Bart Ehrman and scholars and stuffs. I know that you are, are probably going to respond to my video here, so I would love to hear what evidence you have that disputes my adoptionism explanation as well as my Aramaic explanation. Uh, conversely, I would love for you to explain how Aramaic appearing in the Gospels specifically targets Jesus and totally eliminates any other influence out, uh, you know, in the surrounding area. Like, I want to know exactly how Aramaic pinpoints Jesus in history. If it was the case that the initial Jesus movement was made up of Jews who were influenced by Stoicism and Philo, how does that explain anything about the use of Aramaic in the text? How does that help us explain why Jesus was very corporeal early in the church and becomes increasingly divine as time goes on? These are the questions that have to be answered whether or not you think there is an historical Jesus. The question is which theory best accounts for the observation. And my position is, 
has been, and until I'm convinced differently, will continue to be the theory that most accurately and consistently explains what we observe in the text is the theory that Jesus was a real person in history who existed, who had real followers, who was a real Jew, who preached a real apocalyptic form of Judaism. That's all I'm trying to do in this series, is make the case that that theory is the best one. <laughs> Except you haven't given any credible evidence to suggest that mythicism fails on any of these points. I don't see how you can say that the historical Jesus is the only hypothesis that actually explains the evidence. You're just claiming that mythicism can't answer these questions and then, and then just saying that historicity wins. That's exactly like a pigeon shitting on a, on a chessboard. I would contend that minimal mythicism uh, perfectly explains all these things and has explanatory power on other issues. I mean, these two bits of, of quote-unquote evidence or questions that you have uh, don't break mythicism at all. And I've been able to logically and reasonably explain why they happen regardless of whether or not Jesus actually existed. These uh, claims that I'm making don't require any kind of assumptions. So I know that you love to use Occam's razor, albeit incorrectly, but you like to use it. Being that Occam's razor says that the one theory or hypothesis that's based on the least amount of assumptions, I would say that uh, it's actually mythicism that best explains the evidence rather than historicity. Because they were Jewish Christians. The Gospels and Paul all got their information from Scripture. None of it was written by eyewitnesses. Theological debates happen because the Messiah is an interpreted figure from Jewish scriptures. This is happening even now. And nothing about your video here breaks mythicism or your other previous videos. And I guess that means it's time for me to say that I've been Christy. You've been awesome. Oh, shucks. Thanks for admitting that I'm awesome. Well, guys, I would love to know what your thoughts are down below in the comments. Please let me know. Let me know where you stand on the mythicist uh, question. Do you think Jesus actually existed in history or not? I will be doing follow-up videos to Christy here, uh, so please stick around for that. If you're not subscribed, do that right now, and I will see you heathens later. Don't forget to stand up, use your voice.